Okay, I didn't start the presentation yet, so there we started the presentation. Um, reminder about the tutoring. Tutoring started last Thursday. The second tutoring session was last night. Um, I am not very confident that anyone showed up, but I hope somebody did, so he didn't completely waste his time. But DJ is there to, to help you understand material to supplement my teaching. So remember that. <laughs> I forgot last week to remind people about the Haystack Supper, and we had an abysmal showing. I blame that on me for not reminding you guys. So I'm making sure I remind everyone, if you are in any way interested in medicine, we would like to encourage you to come to Casey, I believe it's 200, tonight at 530, where Dr. Roddy will be talking about Loma Linda's School of Medicine and how to get in and whatnot. So it's open to anyone who has any interest, and they do have pizza. So if you have an interest in medicine and like pizza, you know, it's a perfect, perfect match. Okay. Oh, I have a question. Go ahead. Um, the hours for tutoring are 6 to 8 on Monday and 7 to 9 on Thursday. I thought you said it was Sunday. That, I did I say Monday instead of Sunday? Oh, yeah. Okay, so we have talked about one-dimensional motion, the problems, the kind of problems that we did in class on Friday. We had things like a person jumping up or a drag shirt, you know, accelerating forward, kind of things we were doing the homework with that. And in doing those problems, we had our kinematic equations. But life is generally not just one-dimensional. It's three-dimensional in space. So, you know, here are just the roller coaster is there to remind us that the roller coaster goes forward, but it also goes up and down and side to side. So in real life, what we're doing is just a piece of the puzzle and not the whole thing. And so as people were commenting in the perusal, you know, talking about what it says, you know, why do we do the one dimensional? Because once we learn how to do one dimensional kinematic equations, then we can go from there to doing two dimensional and if you can do two-dimensional, you can do three-dimensional. We're not going to ever go to three dimensions. Just, you know, we once you've gone two-dimensional, we say, okay, they've got that step down. One more dimension isn't going to make it any more complicated. Now, before we get started, I want to I put the slide in. Well, forget it. I put the slide. Oh, yeah. I put it in, but apparently I didn't get it time to save before I opened it. So go to WooClap which is what I had showing before we started. And yeah, I'll give you a few minutes to, to take a picture and go there. Notice you can also go directly to this. You can bookmark it and just you know go there. Or you can send a text message to this number that says AFIS 151 and it will get you going as well. Okay. So going to our first question, our first question is one that, you've, one that you've already seen. I forgot to delete it, so we already have 11 answers. Um, will it let, allow you to answer again? No. no. No? Okay, well, that's okay. Remember, when we do add vectors, we add them graphically in the tip to tail or tail to tip. I don't care which order you put them. I learned tip to tail. Most textbooks, it appears, use the tail of the tip. And in when, you do, when you do it with the ruler, and I said compass there. Somebody said, I don't know what a compass is. I'm like, I don't either, clearly, because it's a protractor. So the protractor is for measuring angles, so you get the lengths and the angles correct. So I'm sorry that I used the wrong word there. We're also going to do a little bit of practice today and doing it analytically just to make sure that we're all clear on it as we move forward. Now, something new. I have something set up here. I have, and it's turned off so it won't drop. When the ball comes out of here, that thing is going to drop. And this here, it's, it's turned off now, so it's not dropping now. And this here finds the ball. Okay? So, 
I, I will. <laughs> this is a very, quote, famous, end quote, that is every physics teacher in every general physics class uses it, problem. And the problem, as stated when I was a child, these days you have people that are a little more uh, concerned about animal welfare, says that there is a hunter that is hunting a monkey. Russell? How fast is the projectile moving? Is what? How fast is the projectile moving? Doesn't matter. I, I don't know, but it doesn't matter. <laughs> doesn't matter. Okay, so there's a hunter, and he's hunting these monkeys. These are very rare monkeys that are kind of like opossums. You know, an opossum, when you scare them, what do they do? They, they, they act dead, and it's not like they're, ooh, I'm a good actor. It's their body releases a chemical that basically their fight or flight instinct is all about uh, overload and lose consciousness. So these monkeys do the same thing. They hear the gun report, and they just fall. And so shooting the monkey is a little different because it's going to fall when you shoot it. So the question is, where should you shoot? Should you shoot above the monkey to account for the ball dropping, at the monkey, or below the monkey to account for the monkey dropping? Are you using a scope, or are you just like eyeballing it? Well, well I, I, I have, I, I will eyeball my aim here. I don't have, so it is possible for me to miss because I'm eyeballing my aim. But we're just, if you're the hunter, where should you be aiming? Should you be aiming above that thing, at it, or below it? The polling is close. Yeah, I talked too long. Also, it, sh it shows you what people are answering. We don't want that. Yes, Russell, what's your question? Okay, so the polling is open now. What's your question, Russell? Excuse me? <laughs> I'm glad Max has confidence. It, it does not matter. The, the only way it matters is if the gun doesn't have a to make it to the bear. It doesn't matter. It's really weird. We're going to. We're in physics. We're going to actually do it to see if we're right with our predictions. We're going to shoot the target. Okay, we only have six answers. We should have the ballpark of 14. We'll help to vote oh, you're right. It timed out. Okay. We can vote again. Everybody, make sure you get your answers in there. There's no shame in being wrong. There's shame in not answering. Everybody understand how we shame people here? <laughs> we don't shame people in the classroom as they answer, but. Okay. Come on. Still got six more that have an answer. Only two answered in that half minute period. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Come on, you last five. One person is confusing. <laughs> One person is proudly confused. Okay, two more. Yeah, I'm not going to extend it this time. We'll just have a couple people who didn't. So let's see what each selected. Yes, sir. So five people said at the target, five said below the target, and two people said above the target. So now we're actually going to do the experiment. And to the best of my ability, I have aimed this directly at the target. So basically, if it goes above the target, then the people who said one will be right. If it goes below the target, the people who said three will be right. And if it hits the target, the people who said two will be right. Clear enough? Yeah. So now, you need to put the pack at a distance. Yeah, I know. Then I would aim much better. I'm going to double check my aim one last time. I think that looks good. Um, there are some dots on the target already. I've circled all of the pre-existing ones. I know I should show you beforehand, but I don't feel like going up there and taking it down. Just show. Well, actually, 
I can just put my finger here and drop it. Then I have to go up there and put it back up. So y'all ready for this? It's exciting, right? Yes. <laughs> Boom! That's my best aim ever. <laughs> it's hard to aim this thing right. So I aimed at the target, and now we look for the dot. There's, there's the dot where it hit. Now I was a little off side to side, but I was pretty much dead on vertically. And of course, we were only talking about the vertical aspect, so, so I'm taking that as my best ever. Before I lose the damn train. Okay, so why was it that I had to shoot at the target, not above, not below? Let, let me, before I answer that, or before you answer that, go back a step. Does anyone here have experience with something like a archery or shooting a gun and how to aim? Okay, Andy and David raised their hand, and Leah. Okay, so we got, we got a fair people, amount of people. So when you're aiming, if you're aiming at something close, how do you aim? Where? Directly at it. What if it's something far? Okay, so we have some disagreement. What's going to happen to your bullet once it comes out of your gun? It's going to drop because gravity is going to act on it. It's in free fall once it comes out of the gun. I know somebody made a comment last week or the week before on Cruise all about, you know, they, they said, interesting fact, at least as I've been told, if you fire gun horizontally or you drop the bullet, they'll both hit the ground at the same time. It's absolutely true if there's no air. Wow. If there's no air, Somebody's a little crowd. That's, that's why his comment says, Maxwell Jones. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody uses a Okay. Um, so the bullet's going to drop once it comes out of the gun. And so when you're shooting at something far, you're shooting up above, so the bullet will go up and then come back down. How much does the bullet drop from the straight line that you are aimed at? Let's say you're one second out. How far will it have dropped from the straight line? It will have dropped, actually it's 4.9. The speed in the vertical direction will have changed by 9.8. So you're thinking in the right vein. But you use that distance is equal to 1 half AT squared. And if T is 1 and A is 9.8, then you have 1 half, 9.8, which is 4.9, times 1. So it will drop 1 meter from the straight line that you were aimed at. 2 seconds, it will drop 4 times 4.9, which is 19.6 meters. And so it deviates from that straight line more and more each second. And so I have two follow-ups here to illustrate this. So that was not it. I don't know which one of these moves forward, but apparently it's the one I can't see. So here's a picture illustrating how it deviates with time. You know, if you shoot straight. Now this picture here is the new and more humane version of the monkey is dropping a pineapple instead of the monkey itself drops. You can see that we have moved forward in our physics understanding of the importance of life. And this is, I know, pretty poor quality. The next one is also poor, but it's a video. Oops, why did it do that? Okay, I know. When I, I must have hit up above when I went to full screen. There we go. So here you see the projectile being fired and the target dropping and hitting the target. An, an illustration of what we saw a little slower than, than what happened. I'm still very, very proud just for the record. So just one more thing on aiming a gun. So this is something I think Oksana was referring to. If you're aiming a gun and you have sights, and your sights have different ranges, why do you have a different position for the sight depending on the range? To calculate the drop. It's going to drop more if it's farther away, and so it's going to move your sight so you're aiming higher. 
So ultimately, if I'm shooting something that's really slow, so it won't hurt him, at David, I'm going to aim like this. My sight says like this, and it goes, and comes down, right? And so when you read about people, snipers making a shot from, you know, like 1,600 kilometers, that's basically a mile, their shot had to really go up above and drop down on them. It's pretty crazy. Did you have a question? No. Okay. What? 1,600 kilometers. Oh, no, did I say kilometers? I meant meters. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> that's, a, that's an ICBM or something. <laughs> well, it doesn't have to be intercontinental. But, you know, that's a, yeah. That's not going to happen. So when we're analyzing two-dimensional motion like this problem dealt with, we use what we call independence of motion. If I choose two mutually perpendicular directions, so they have to be perpendicular to each other, and in two dimensions it's ridiculous to say mutually perpendicular. So when you get to three dimensions, then you can say mutually perpendicular, that means this perpendicular this, this perpendicular this, this perpendicular this. So our three dimensions, we have three mutually perpendicular directions. Two-dimensional motion, if you choose two directions that are perpendicular to each other, you can do all of the calculations on one dimension completely separate from the calculations in the other direction. Now, to make life easiest, you always want to choose your directions so that it's minimum calculations. That means since acceleration is a vector, it has a direction. Always choose if you have acceleration. So the acceleration is parallel to one of your dimensions. Then the acceleration in the other direction, what is it, what is it going to be? Like, let's say I have something falling due to gravity, which is what everything's going to be today. If it's falling due to gravity, what direction is the acceleration? Down. Down, because that's how we define down. And so what's the acceleration in the horizontal direction? Zero, because you just break that vector into its component, how much of it is down? All of it, how much is horizontal, none of it. And so then in your calculations, you have acceleration only in one of the two dimensions. And so the dimension without acceleration has easier calculations. So this is a picture just illustrating the difference in motion of two balls, one that's dropped straight down and one that is projected out. So this is like Max's comment about shooting a gun. The blue ball is the bullet that came out of the muzzle of the gun, and the red one is the bullet you dropped. Funny but true story. I don't know why I was watching this, but I was watching a Saturday Night Live um, on tryouts for Superman, and the guy shoots a bullet, and you know, they're trying to catch it in their teeth, and they're actually real bullets, and the guys are doing the real stuff. It's, yeah, we're Saturday Night Live. Anyway, so one guy manages to catch it in his teeth, and then they take the bullet out, and it still has the casing. When you shoot a bullet, only the front part comes out. The part that contains the powder stays in the gun. But that's, sorry, this just reminded me of that. It's, it's, it's reasonable to note. So you can calculate the vertical drop, the same for both of these. But the horizontal is different because the blue one has a horizontal component to its motion. Now, before we do a problem, we're going to practice real quick something we've already learned to do, breaking vectors into components and adding them. So first, how to add graphs. You add them tip to tail if you do it graphically. You need to measure the lengths carefully so you have a scale. People were asking, do I have to have a scale? Yes. Does the scale have to be metric? No. But the scale has to be a scale that's reproducible, so when you're done, you can measure the length of the resultant and translate back to what it really is. So you add them tip to tail or tail to tip. So the leftmost picture shows the first vector. Then you have the second vector put at the end of the first vector. And then where does the result start and where does it end? It starts at the beginning of the first vector and ends at the end of the second vector. Right. It starts at the beginning of the first vector, ends at the end of the last vector. So C is showing a darker blue going from the beginning of the first to the end of the second, that's the correct resultant. 
What's wrong with D? It went from the end to the beginning instead of from the beginning to the end. So it's the wrong direction. It's 180 degrees off. So this is here just to make sure you don't make that mistake, which is easy to do, obviously. Then we have doing things analytically, using math. We generally prefer using math to do it because we have a lot more precision when we do it with math than when we try to measure the scale and try to measure the angle. So we have these rules, definition of sine, some old hippie sine is opposite over hypotenuse. Gamma hopping, cosine is adjacent over hypotenuse. Through our alley, tangent is adjacent over, or op, excuse me, our opposite over adjacent. These only apply if it's a right triangle. Don't try to use these if it's not a right triangle. And then we have the Pythagorean theorem if it's a right triangle that says a squared plus b squared equals c squared. So these rules here all apply to right triangles. What's the last one that's shown here? If it's a right triangle, remember the sum of the interior angles of a triangle is always 180 degrees. So if a right triangle, if one of them is 90, you have 90 remaining for the other two. And so the other two have to add up to 90 is what that's saying. So those are rules we use. Have a method. A method is a good thing to do. I'm going to do a problem here right after this slide. And I'm going to follow this method. So first, I will select a convenient set of mutually perpendicular coordinate directions and draw them with my figure. If you don't draw them with your figure, it's not going to be meaningful to anyone looking at your work. You know, it's so much in the x direction, but I don't know what direction x is. Maybe that one. Right, you need to define it. Then break each vector into its components. Remember, the components are the pieces. The sum of the components has to be the whole. Some of the pieces has to be the whole. So if you add your components tip to tail, you better get your result that you've broken the components. And then you add like components. So I'm going to show adding like components and then use the Pythagorean theorem to find the magnitude, tangent to find the angle. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to add these three vectors. And I'm going to go over to one note to do it because I'm not going to fit, do it all on, on one slide here. So going to one note, I'm going to add these. So first, I'll take vector A. So vector A has a magnitude of 25 meters. The angle defined there is 49 degrees. My components are already drawn for me. The x direction is horizontal. The y direction is vertical. So going back to, was it last week or the week before, actually, what did I tell you to do to break them into components? Well, first what Sarah was indicating with her hand. I drop a line parallel to, there I did parallel to the y-axis. Here I'll do parallel to the x-axis just because it doesn't matter which one you do. And then from the other end, so I have two potential right triangles. How do I know the right triangles? Because it's a 90 degree angle between the X and Y directions. Now, because I have the 49 degree angle within the lower triangle, I'm going to erase the upper one and just work with the lower one. And I'm going to erase my 90 degree because it was blocking. So there I have my components and then I identify is AX the adjacent side or the opposite side? Well, I am going to use cosine, but the, the question to lead us to make sure we know why we're using cosine is, is, is it the adjacent or the opposite? And it's the adjacent side. How do you know it's the adjacent side? Because it's part of the angle that I have. And so AY is the opposite side. I didn't ask you about the hypotenuse because, well, I've done this too many times and I always assume we know. The hypotenuse is the longest side, the one opposite to the right angle. So the hypotenuse is also part of making the angle. So now that I've defined these, then I use my trig functions, as Oksana said, and the one that relates the known value, the hypotenuse, with the AX unknown is cosine. 
So I'm going to have cosine of theta a or is equal to ax over, and I'm going to put in a, a is 25 meters. So if I want to solve that for ax, I just multiply both sides by a. So multiply both sides by a. And I have ax is equal to a cosine theta. And so I get a value for that. Now, as some of you who've come to my office have seen, the way I do this A vector equals, and I have here in the x direction, here in the y direction. And so I'm going to put the value I get from 25 meters cosine of 49. What is it, Sarah? 16.4. Okay, 16.4 meters. Now I go overboard. Because I'm writing this as an equation, that is, I have a vector sign there in my A. I need to have something to designate direction in my equal sign. Even though the column says it's the x direction, I'm redundant and I put a little x with a hat over it. What does the hat mean? It means it has a magnitude of 1 in the direction of x. So that's just telling me it's in the x direction. Now for the y, my a, y is that opposite, adjacent, or hypotenuse? It's opposite. So what trig function relates opposite and hypotenuse? Sine. So I'm going to have a y, and I'm now short-circuiting the work, is a sine of 49 degrees, which is 25 meters times sine of 49 degrees. And what does that give me? 18.9. I put my y hat. Now, are those looking at the directions of x and y? If I start at the base and go to the tip, I have to go first right and then up. So going right, was that positive in the X or negative in the X? Positive. Going up, was that positive in the Y or negative in the Y? Positive. positive. So I have to actually look at that to make sure I have my signs right. So now let's go to B. Notice with all of these vectors, they gave us the angle between the X axis and the vector. So you always need to check which side is adjacent and which side is opposite. But for all three of these, they gave us that the X component is adjacent, the Y component is opposite because the angle is from the X axis. So I'm not going to go through and rewrite these equations. I'm just going to have BX is equal to B cosine of 15 degrees. Actually, let's put 23 Notice it had 25 meters and 23.0 meters. Great. We went from two sig figs in one to three sig figs in the next. So what do we get for BX? 23 times cosine 15. Okay, and is that positive or negative in the X direction? Positive because you had to go right. And in the y direction, I'm going to have by is equal to 23.0 meters. There I had room to write the whole thing. Sine of 15 degrees. What's that? Positive or negative? Positive, because it was going up. And then C, I won't write C because I've written A and B already. But it's now 32 meters for the hypotenuse and 68 degrees. So what is 32 times cosine of 68 degrees? And is that positive or negative in the x direction? Positive because it's going to the right. What about 32 sine of 68 degrees? It's 9? 29. 29. And it's negative. So two people have identified it's negative. They're correct. How do you know it's negative? Because it was going down. And now we were adding these. 
remember when you start the problem, you have to know what you're doing. We were adding. So A plus B plus C. And you add this first column, which, of course, we have a different number of digits in the first one than the rest. But we do have correct sig figs, well, one plus on correct sig figs for all of them. So what did you give me on them? Five zero. And what did we have for the y direction? All righty. If you were paying attention, what are my significant digits? How many significant digits do I have for the x component? Two. How many do I have for the y component? The the okay. So there's two significant digits. So this is significant to that, and this is significant to that. You only have one minus five to correct significant digits because the least significant digit for each one of these numbers is the one that I put the bar over. The greatest of those is what you have in the answer when you add them together. But we don't apply our significant digits until we're all done. So we now have something that goes over 50.61 meters and then down 4.82 meters. And so the resultant goes like that. How do I find the magnitude? Pythagorean theorem. So the magnitude of, and I'm just going to put R. So absolute value sign means the magnitude is the square root of 50.61 meters squared plus 4.82 meters, oops, meters squared. So what's that? <laughs> Which to one significant digit is 50 because <laughs> that's all we have, folks. One significant digit. Um, you, you, you had two, yeah, two significant digits in the 50.6. So significant digits are, well, it's just poor outcome. And then for the angle, this angle here, how do I find it? I, I'm going to use arctan. You, there are multiple ways of doing it, but the quickest way is using arctan. Tan minus one of opposite, 4.82 meters over adjacent, 50.61 meters. So my answer, our vector, is I'm going to at least put 51 meters just uh, pretending it was 25.0 that they gave us for the first one at 5.4 degrees. And then I have to end with my reference. Okay. South of East is what we would traditionally have with this. So that's a correct answer because that was there. I forgot it was there. The other way of writing it would have been minus Y of X. Because the, this here at of that's the word O F of my handwriting. So there, notice the organization that I used. The primary reason I spent 10, 15 minutes doing this was just to make sure you see that organization and how simple it is if you just have an organized attack plan. Okay, back to the presentation. So here's something more realistic. A fellow is kicking a ball. Now, this is more realistic, and at the same time, it's not, because you probably know how many people play golf. One-ish. Well, you, you can have the ball come off of your club going exactly the direction you want, and then it goes, wham, or wham. Why? It's spinning, and as it spins, 
it causes air pressure to be bigger on one side and small on the other, and it makes it curve. Well, in our general physics world, there's no air. So in, in our general physics world, that wouldn't happen. So this, you know, we're going to do problems as if there's no air. But we have to realize there is air. Golf balls, I think they go something like three times farther than they would if there was no air. On the other hand, baseballs go shorter than they would go if there was no air. Because the golf balls, you put a backspin on them, which makes them rise, so you make them go flatter, and then they spend a longer time in the air, allows them to go farther. Okay, so let's look at, okay, I didn't realize until an hour before class that I need to have Shockwave installed for this to work. And I did not want to spend the time installing it and then have something go wrong and not be able to do lecture. And so I am simply going to switch over to the other computer where I have it already set up to go. So here we have a motorcycle. And the simulation doesn't show the motorcycle driving up. It just shows him on the ramp. And then when I hit play, he's going to take off in the ramp and go flying through the air based on acceleration in the vertical direction and no acceleration in the horizontal direction. And what we want to do is we want to make him land on these pillows. Now, we didn't do any calculation here. And so right off the bat, we're just going to hit play and see if he comes right on them if he's too far or if he's too short. And what's the point of asking you? Because we haven't done the calculation. We just don't know. Oh, he went too far. He missed it. So what should we do to make the distance he travels in the air shorter? What did you say, sir? Okay, Sarah said increase his angle. Someone else? Okay, two people said reduce velocity. There's another correct answer. We're not messing with gravity. <laughs> what did you say, Dan? Oh, I thought you did. did you say something else? Uh, reduce speed was already called. There's a third. Move the pillows. No, we're not moving the pillows or the starting point. Change the bike. No, we're not. Our parameters are simply, um, on the, you can't see them on that one, the angle, the velocity, and the velocity. So we had increase the angle, lower the velocity. There is a third answer that's correct. No. What well, you you could, but I'm just looking at individual results. The other one, I'll tell you, is to lower the angle. Because if you increase the angle, when he comes off the ramp, what's happening to his vertical velocity? It's increasing. So he's going to be in the air longer. What's happening to his horizontal velocity? It's going to decrease. So he's going. if you increase the angle, he's going upward faster, but horizontally slower. So he's in the air longer because he starts upward faster, going to fly up higher, take longer in the air. But he's going slower horizontally, and so that could make him go a slower distance. If you go flatter, he's not as much in vertical component, so he's not going to be in the air as long, but he's going faster in the horizontal direction. So let's, let's start by doing stupid stuff because that's more fun. Yes. Here's a big angle, like 60 degrees. Obviously, none of us are going to take off and jump at 60 degrees because we're not complete gluttons for punishment. But look, boom, nailed it with the 60-degree angle. Now I'm going to lower the angle. 30 degrees because it is symmetric, about 45 <laughs> So at a third-degree angle, he doesn't go nearly as high, but he's going faster, and he lands in the middle again. So either raising or lowering the angle would have worked, or going back to the 45-degree angle. The first answer I think we got was slow his butt down. So we'll slow him down to six. Oh, six was too slow. Six and a half is probably still too slow. That's where I'm going with it. Seven barely made it. I wouldn't want to trust that. I'd go to you know, 7.4. Bueno. 
Now this has some other cool things like you can see where he was each moment time and axes. There's actually another option here. Yes, we can aim at the monkey. Where should we aim? <laughs> okay, that person wants me to hit the monkey instead of the coconut. <laughs> so let's shoot. Nailed it, right? Okay, so I'm just making sure it'll go high. Okay, just making sure it go over its head. Why am I wasting time shooting the monkey? Oh. <laughs> All right. So you can see that shooting directly at the monkey worked. Um, because Russell was asking about this, or directly at the coconut, because Russell was asking, so there's directly at the coconut. Let's change the speed. Um, all we have is the simulation speed, unfortunately. We don't have the actual speed because it doesn't matter. So they didn't give us the option of making it go faster or slower. Sorry. Would have been cool. Yeah. So if, it's, if it is going faster or slower, like faster just means that gravity hasn't had enough time to act on either object, so it just cross paths Right. Higher. If it's faster, it's going to hit higher. That's what we would have seen. Okay. If it's slower, it's going to hit lower. It's still going to hit. All right. Now it's time to do problem. Sea bass. Former Raider kicker, didn't want to change to a current one, even though Carlson's a whole lot better than we had before him. Seabass yeah. is attempting a 60 meter, which is 65.6 .6 yard field goal, something that was well within his abilities, although I think the farthest he made was 65. Um, the ball leaves his foot at a speed of 31.3 meters per second, an angle of 48 degrees above the horizon. The crossbar in the goalpost is 3.048 meters off the ground. Assuming no air resistance, will he make this kick? Hmm? Well, he used to be on the Raiders. He was, he's with Seattle now. It doesn't matter. What matters is the problem. So when we solve problems, we have a method. No, 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 we'll come back. Okay. We have a method that we want to follow. We want to analyze the two-dimensional projectile, projectile motion by breaking it first into its components. I need to decide what directions to use for my components. Well, what rule did I tell you for determining what directions to use? Yes, make one of them parallel to acceleration. Well, since this is in free fall, the acceleration is just the acceleration of gravity, so that's the vertical direction. So you choose one direction to be vertical. Does it need to be up or down? No, it could be either way. We choose up, we say that's the y direction. So in this picture, you see it already has y and x defined as y is vertical, x is horizontal. But it's important to understand the reason why. So when you get a different situation, you can make a wise decision and cut down your amount of work. Okay? Then we solve the x direction problem completely independently of the y direction problem, except for time is going to be the same for both of them. So we can then tie the two together with time. Now we need to look at our strategy for this problem. So we're going to use vertical and horizontal, and then we're going to work with the x direction, the y direction independently. But how do we determine if he's going to make the kick or not? This is where the physics comes in, where we have to think about how can we determine if he makes the kick or not. But we need to be able to know. You what? Like, what is the... Um, we'll get to using equations once we figure out how we're going to determine if the field goal is made or not. Andy. So for the hypotenuse of 10 meters up and 60 meters across, and if the hypotenuse is greater than half, it. it's, it's more complicated than that, sadly. <laughs> Unfortunately. Yeah. If there was no acceleration, 
Sure. But because the acceleration is going to be more, more difficult. Oh, yeah. Okay, yeah, very good. So let's draw a picture. Okay, let's draw a picture. That is a great way to start. So we're going to go to one note to work on the problem because, once again, there's no way I finish this on one screen. So we draw a picture. So here's, here's where he kicks the ball. And here's the goal posts. Okay, I know this is not the right perspective. It's good enough. And so we have that ball starting out at an angle of 48 degrees and a speed that is 31.3 meters per second. And it's going to come off and then curve because of gravity. And our question is, is it going to cross over the crossbar or under the crossbar? Well, yeah, the way I drew it is, is going over the crossbar, or hitting the crossbar maybe. But we need to determine if that's going to happen. There's also 60 meters between the two. Oh, yes, thank you. And that is very important. Mm -hmm. yeah. Make my safe figs. I should have put 60.0 just to make sure it's three sig figs. Yeah, everything else has three sig figs. What was that? Oh, yes. This is 3.048 meters. Because we only have four minutes, I know nobody's come up with a way. Yeah, but the way to solve this, the easiest, there's always multiple ways to solve the problem, it turns out. The, the easiest way is first you break into components. We said we have to do that. And then I'm going to use the horizontal component to figure out how long it's going to take to get 60 meters away. And then once I know how long it's going to take to get 60 meters away, I'm going to check what its elevation is at that time. If its elevation is above 3.048 meters, it made it. If the elevation is below 3.048 meters, it was short. Assuming he was online, of course. So let's do this work. So I have my x direction, my y direction clearly identified. And so now I'm going to have my x direction information separate from my y direction information. My starting position, I'm going to arbitrarily choose to be zero. My ending position, what's my ending position for the x direction? 60 meters. 60 meters. Wow. What's my initial speed in the x direction? No. Okay, so we have that 48.0 degree angle. We know the hypotenuse is 31.3. Which side is Vx0? In adjacent or, or opposite? Adjacent. Okay. Question? The reason we know it's going in the x direction is because it's like going this way, not because it's going straight up and down. Um, I broke it into its two directions. It's going both vertically and horizontally. And right now I'm only looking at the horizontal motion. So when you break it into the y, are you also going to use that same? I'm going to use the same triangle, but I'm going to use vy0 instead of vx0. That, that's the key concept for today is that we use the vertical direction, the horizontal direction independently. So we have our vector that had some in the X, some in the Y, and we only look at the X parts, and then we're going to only look at the Y parts. By the way, did I call you Aaliyah earlier instead of Anna? Sorry. You are sitting close to each other. Okay, so this is the adjacent side. So VX0 is equal to my 31.3 meters per second times cosine. I know I'm going really fast, but I only have one minute left now. 
We obviously aren't going to get to the end of this. What do I get for that speed? Someone with the calculator. 20.9. Do you have one more digit? AX, what's my acceleration in the X direction? Negative. Zero. That's why we chose the direction. And so now, because the acceleration is all in the vertical direction. And so in the horizontal direction, it's zero. So now we'll just say X final equals X initial plus VX initial T plus one half AX T squared. But we know that AX is zero, or excuse, yes, is zero. Yeah, I did that right. And X zero is zero. So solving for time is trivial. Time is equal to X final over VX initial equals 60 meters over 20.94 meters per second equals slightly less than three seconds. What do we get? Two point nine eight. My estimation failed. Now we'll go to the y direction. Y initial is zero. Y final. We're going to check to see what y final is. We have that. 3.048 meters, we want to see if it's above or below that. VY initial is going to be from this same triangle, 31.3 meters per second sine of 48 degrees. 23.26. And AY is equal to minus 9.80 meters per second squared. And now we're going to find y final equals y initial plus vy initial t plus one half a y t squared. Do we use the same time that we got from the x? Yep. The time is what ties them together. That's exactly it. So that's 23.26 meters per second times 2.865. plus one half minus 9.80 meters per second squared times 2.865 seconds quantity squared. And what do we get for y final? Anyone else? It is two minutes past. I let you go early on Friday, but I held you late on Wednesday. Now I'm late again. Yeah, that's what I got too. <laughs> Twenty-six point four meters, well above the crossbar, and that's unrealistic because nobody makes a sixty-five yard field goal without a system. Okay, have a great day. I'll see you in the lab tomorrow, unless you're physics two fifty-two. I'll see you or, or two fifty-one. And remember to do the pre-lab quiz before lab.